Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to another edition of the best DFS show that just happens to start around 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six and all the main sites. Welcome to another edition of the EPL Breakdown for Saturday, January 12th, 2019. EPL match week 22 i'm really excited about this one i think there's going to be a ton of edges because there's going to be a ton of people jumping all over liverpool and chelsea salaries and honestly there's tons of other options across the board in particular around the different ak ranges and DraftKings that i'm really excited about but without wasting too much time uh let's jump in here right away uh, as always let's take a quick look at the schedule uh first uh, game on the early slate is a uh, west ham and arsenal that's going to be an absolute banger i'm really looking forward to that uh a really good London Derby and I'm expecting a huge Arsenal win there hopefully by at least four goals uh, the next game, uh, we, or I guess shouldn't say the next game, to start the slate off this weekend, uh, we have uh, Burnley and Fulham, uh, Crystal Palace and Watford, Cardiff and Huddersfield Brighton and Liverpool, Leicester City and Southampton, and the late game of uh, the afternoon is uh, Chelsea and Newcastle, and then obviously on Sunday uh, there's Everton uh, versus Bournemouth and Spurs versus United, and then on Monday uh, w Man City versus Wolves. So uh, basically, let's uh, jump right into the DraftKings slate. Um, I want to start here, obviously, with the Liverpool at Brighton. First game of the slate. Uh, in terms of Liverpool, what to talk about here. The real issue for Liverpool is that, much like Chelsea and the other big-name teams here, they're going through a particular point of the season where their legs are giving out from them. Is a really simple way to put it. They're reaching a point where they've played such a substantial amount of minutes against such high-quality teams, such as taking trips to Paris or different spots in Europe. Uh, they're hitting a point where the rotation has started to add up and they're losing games. Uh, they're getting injuries, especially Liverpool across their defensive back line here across the board are very injured this late so it is a concern that Liverpool may not be fully 100% up for this like their salaries would suggest especially in comparison to the potential ceilings from other salaries that are just slightly below the Liverpool and Chelsea salary so we'll start off with uh, Liverpool and we can take a look obviously Allison's always in play because Liverpool are Liverpool but at the same time they've conceded in like uh, 10 of 15 of uh, their away games in all competitions this season. I think that's the stat. So uh, they're not a team. Uh, you can check out my article this week. It'll be on the, the Rotopros main page, rotopros.com. Uh, make sure to jump up into the articles, drop down uh, the soccer, should be in there. And I'll have all the main stats and breakdowns for each team. But Liverpool concede and quite simply just aren't as good of a team away from home than they are at home. So anytime they are away from home, it's something to consider in terms of maybe they won't do as well as we need them to compared to their salaries, ownerships, and relative comparison to the rest of the slate. Uh, and uh, I think that a lot uh, can be said, excuse me, a lot should start with uh, Allison uh, at 5.7K the slate. Uh, because again, we'll get to Brighton in a second here. They're just, they're not someone to write off instantly as a clean sheet. Uh, like some other lesser known teams that are playing some really bad teams this slate. So yeah, the big issue here is that Liverpool are going to be forced to do one of three things. Either the first thing they're going to do is they're going to try and shoot from distance, uh, which won't work out unless Shakiri's on the field in the middle of the park sitting behind Firmino. If that's the case, jump on some from uh, Shakiri and cash the slate. The second thing that Liverpool may end up being forced to do is cross the ball a lot, which they're going to fail at miserably. Now, if that's the case, though, we can take someone like Trent Alexander Arnold in DK on DK because of his uh, potential crossing output. But at the same time, we can't really justify that on FanDuel because his conversion or efficiency rate won't be creating a lot of chances because Brighton has one of the best clearance defenders in the league in Shane Duffy. And it should be no surprise to anyone for me, you know, won't be able to handle the likes of Shane Duffy in the air. So I see the cross crossing outcome is very unlikely unless it comes from set pieces. Now, the set pieces is really where we have to start talking here. And if James Milner is starting this slate, he is 
probably one of if not the top play of the slate for midfields and only 7k will be handling the majority of the set pieces will hopefully see 90 minutes especially with Jordan Henderson not being at a full 100% along with uh, Fabino potentially having to play center back uh, you'll notice Lover and Van Dyke Gomez and Matip are all uh, potentially out to confirmed out uh, Van Dyke should be playing but outside of that it's still a little bit up in the air as to who will be healthy enough to go and they may end up putting Fabino as a center back which is what they did uh, to their loss against Wolves uh, in the midweek there again uh, or I should say in the midweek in the cup tie against Wolves and if you're more interested to read uh, what's been happening in uh, the previous slates uh, again check out my article I have uh, all the recent results for Liverpool listed in there from uh, the cup ties for all the teams so yeah it's important to note that Liverpool are very injured right now and if Milner gets the 90 minute start I think he's going to be one of the top plays this slate in either format and I'll talk about why very shortly now as I touched on earlier uh Liverpool can't play Firmino, Shaqiri, uh, Mane and Salah all at the same time along with having someone like uh, Naby Keita or even Milner or Lalana sitting behind Firmino in that pocket. It needs to be Shakiri. If it's not Shakiri, we have to deeply consider, reconsider, excuse me, our entire Liverpool strategy for this slate. But if it is Shakiri behind that pocket, uh, I prefer Shakiri over the entire bunch. Now, the main reason is that the third thing that Liverpool are going to be forced to do outside of taking long shots and crossing is threading a lot of through passes into the channel between the wing backs and the center backs on Brighton. Now, what this means is that guys like Milner and guys like Shakiri playing in that pocket position behind Firmino uh, will have tons of opportunity to be threading those balls in, and they will be the main vocal points of the offense, not Salah, uh, until Salah will be the one finishing. Uh, or Mane, someone from the wings will be finishing. I don't expect Firmino to be a big part of this game whatsoever. Maybe get an assist laying off. But outside of that, uh, Brighton should have no issue keeping up with him and handling him physically. But in terms of where Liverpool is going to find success is those uh, those channel passes that are going to be slipped through. Generally from uh, the top of the 18 to 25, 30 yards out where they're trying to sneak one where Salah and Mane will cut in behind from the wing backs towards the center backs and uh, try and get a little through ball now uh, Liverpool is very good at that Uh, I will say that now um, it also should be said that Liverpool too are most likely going to draw a penalty shot Uh, because if in fact they rely on this third situation what's going to happen more time than not is they're going to be drawing fouls especially Salah's speed and if that's the case uh, you're going to have to go with either Salah or Milner in that in that rationale. Uh, I prefer, again, I prefer Milner. He should be taking the penalty shots ahead of Salah. So if Milner is on the field, again, I think he's the top Liverpool play uh, just due to the set pieces upside, which should be abundant this slate, and the fact that the only way Liverpool are going to find success this slate is from those threaded passes, giving Milner multiple assist upside as well in the case that that uh, it's not penalty shots that get done. So, yeah, that's uh, my Liverpool take for this slate. Now, Brighton is a completely different scenario. Um, I've been saying this for multiple seasons. I've been saying this multiple times this season. Brighton are one of the heaviest home away splits in the entire league. Uh, Their home games, this is the only reason they stay up is because of their home results. Uh, And again, they've dealt with really big teams uh, throughout the season and kept scores close. They've only lost, and now Brighton is a, a relatively new English Premier League team. They've only been in the league a couple of years. And something I had to look up quite extensively because I didn't believe, Brighton have only lost six games at home in their entire EPL career so far. Two, two, one and a half season technically, uh, which is still incredibly impressive. And of those six losses, five of them were against big six sides. Uh, the only other loss that was against Burnley earlier this season. So it's really important to note here that Brighton are a different team at home and Liverpool are a different team away. Does that mean Liverpool are going to come out here and lose? Not exactly, no. Uh, does that mean Liverpool are going to come out here and score a 5-1 to one victory? 
Uh, probably not. No, like we just have to temper our expectations a little bit here, or at the very least, at the very least, consider this that the opportunity for us to temper our expectations is here because there's not many people that are going to temper expectations when they read Liverpool and they read Brighton. That's just going to scream Liverpool five goals and. That may not be the case. Could that still be the case? Obviously, it's Liverpool. It's always a potential upside. But in terms of the other upside here is that we can kind of expect maybe Liverpool to only win two to one or two to nothing or three to one as a max ceiling. Where from these salaries, especially compared to other salaries in the AK range and compared to other scores and other games, uh, three goals from. 10 to 9 to 10k won't cut it and we'll be talking about that with Chelsea later too uh, but in terms of this slate uh, the only only two guys on Brighton that I would really consider in any light would be Sal- Solly March uh, just because his uh, production across the board is high enough and Glenn Murray uh, if you're looking for an excellent revenge narrative you're given one right away Glenn Murray had lots of time at Liverpool didn't really work out was sold uh, and yeah, he, he, his personal best is, uh, against, uh, Liverpool. Like he's incredible against Liverpool. So have no fear using Glenn Murray and GPP. If you're totally bought into the idea that Liverpool are, uh, or that we should be tempering expectations here, because if we are tempering expectations, that leads two ways. First of all, Brighton should score. Second of all, uh, Liverpool shouldn't score enough. So uh, yeah, I don't mind Glenn Murray, and I think a lot of people will probably jump on something like Grobe or Knockard if he starts. And uh, for me, the, Liverpool just don't offer enough floor to really warrant any kind of floor chase. Where Solly March has enough peripheral production across the board that we don't really need to worry about that set pieces or crosses floor that you need to worry about from uh, Pascal Grobe or Knockard. Uh, so yeah, if you're going anywhere, go uh, Solly March or Glenn Murray. And if you want to be crazy, crazy risky, go Button. Though I would equally expect Liverpool to only get three to five shots and score three to five goals. If you catch my drift, like I don't see Button getting as many saves outside of shots he sees compared to other value keepers this slate. Uh, so what I'll say for a final score here is Liverpool three, uh, Brighton one. Next game on the slate, we have Fulham traveling to Burnley. And this is an absolute humdinger of brutal quality. Now, there's two major talking points for this. First of all, Fulham are basically the worst team in the league. Outside of Huddersfield, and Huddersfield is absolute free fall mode, Fulham should be... Fulham had a lot more expectations than Huddersfield. Let's put it that way. And Fulham are doing just as bad as Huddersfield. So a lot of this has to do with how badly Fulham are doing. Uh, Their clean sheets aren't happening. If you're looking for someone, Callum Chambers at 3.7K is interesting if he starts in the midfield. He offers a really interesting low salary, low floor kind of play. But it definitely isn't something to jump on if he's playing as a a natural center back. Um, The interesting thing is Fulham has only had five different scores this season which is a league low now while their offense hasn't been great it's still been good enough in the sense that we can target some people here for goals and it's going to be the same people every single time in particular Ryan Sessegnon uh, and uh, Schurler uh, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of debating whether or not this is one of the steals of the slate um, in the reverse fixture where Fulham won previous this season uh, Shirley actually broke the slate to shreds. He had, uh, I think it was 11 shots with a goal, finished with 21, 24 fantasy points, completely destroyed the slate. Uh, six times salary, like just destroyed. So there is that narrative there if you want to jump on that from 5.7K, and he is one of those goal scorers. The main focus here should just be avoiding Mitrovic. Now, the fact is that Mitrovic is shooting again, and he is the forward, and he's probably seeing 90 minutes. The problem is, is that from 7.9K, you can have a plethora, a plethora of different options from midfield to forward who are much better than him for even either just a slightly bit more or much less uh just across the board way better options in that 7.9 8k range so 
yeah, uh, I have a no issue just fading Mitrovic and jumping on the other side of things. Uh, like uh, if uh, Kamara or Vieto gets the start, I have no issues with that. But Sherlin GPP is something I can absolutely get behind of this slate. It's not my first object. It's not my first objective for GPP. But uh, if you ended up using it, uh, it definitely isn't the worst play. Now, in terms of Burnley, uh, Burnley's interesting because. Basically, for the rest of the season, every Burnley slate, you're going to have to decide whether or not Tom Heaton is the best keeper of the slate. Now, if you're new to soccer or uh, haven't really heard much about Tom Heaton and haven't been hearing me drone out about him for the past couple of slates, basically, Tom Heaton is DFS Jesus. He's amazing. He's incredible. The reason for this is, one, he plays on Burnley, so he's never going to be that expensive. Two, he plays on Burnley, so he's going to see six to eight saves every single game, minimum four. Like his four saves in back to back games so far isn't the ceiling. This is like a minimum floor for him. It's only going to go up from, from here. Uh, or, excuse me, I guess he only got two against Huddersfield, which is kind of expected and consider Huddersfield are absolutely brutal in every sense of attacking. Uh, so, really, I don't mind Tom Heaton. Uh, again, sorry to continue. He's going to make tons of saves. He's not going to be very expensive. Uh, he, he's always going to have a chance to offset any goal he may let in with massive save counts. And on top of that, nobody's going to want to own Burnley players. So, you're getting ownership, salary discounts, all sorts of discounts on Tom Heaton. He was the England national team goaltender for the World Cup before he got injured last season. And he's been out basically that entire time until two, two or three slates ago. So, I have no issue with Tom Heaton again in either form. I still don't think people have really come around to the full idea of how good of a player he actually is. He's at home this late. He's nowhere close to being the most expensive. He's going to still see tons of shots because Mitrovic is still taking tons of shots and Fulham do take tons of shots. And that's what Burnley plays for. They play for teams that take tons of shots. Uh, unlike uh, Brighton playing for teams that generally play possession like Liverpool are going to be forced to, uh, Burnley play for teams that uh, just take shots from everywhere. They allow shots from everywhere. And what was standing out was from the past couple of seasons, uh, Heaton and Nick Pope, the other goaltender, continually led the league in saves until Joe Hart came in and Burnley was all of a sudden letting four goals in a game. He just wasn't up to the task. Tom Heaton is. He's still going to see four to f four to six shots this game, uh, four to six save opportunities, excuse me, and I'll be really surprised if Fulham score more than once. So, uh, yeah, I have absolutely no issue with Tom Heaton. Uh, another guy that I'm really going to be looking a lot at is Johan Berg Goodmanson. Robbie Brady suspended, so he'll be out, meaning Johan Berg Goodmanson, if he plays, will have exclusive set pieces rights against the, arguably the worst team in the league, arguably the worst defense in the league. Now, he isn't looking like super healthy, which is a problem and a little bit concerning. Uh, so you can look at someone maybe a little bit more like Dwight McNeil for 5.8K, who may end up picking up a lot of the crossing slack. Uh, but in terms of they're going to be crossing the ball, it's just a matter of whom. And if Johan Berg Goodmanson and Robbie Brady and Aaron Lennon are all out, uh, Dwight McNeil basically has to pick up all the slack. So it's tough. I want to say 2 nothing Burnley is a really reasonable result, but what will more likely happen is a 1-1 result, and Tom Heaton still finishes at like 8-10 to 10 fantasy points because he's a legend. Next game on the slate, we have Huddersfield at Cardiff. And I barely want to talk about Huddersfield, but I will very momentarily because Losel is continuing to put up decent numbers despite playing on the league's worst team. Um, I'm really not too interested in these salaries from the defenders, but I won't take anything away from, them, from the fact that Cardiff are Cardiff and they'll probably allow a fair amount of crossing. Uh, with Aaron Moy out, you can still rely on either Pritchard or Billing. I prefer Billing for cash and Pritchard for GPP. Uh, I think Billing has tons of cash floor to carry with no Moy. And from 5.6K, you're not really risking anything. And he's he's not coming off the field. So, yeah, uh, I have absolutely no issue with uh, Billing in cash. But the issue is Huddersfield have easily the worst offense in the league. They're getting relegated 
at no point in English Premier League history has a team after 21 games with only 10 or fewer points avoided relegation. They're going down. It's it's certifiably done at this point. In fact, a lot of the English Premier League is based around math, and there's certain thresholds of points where teams look to achieve to know that they're not getting relegated. And new, excuse me, Huddersfield have long ago lost that threshold. It's done. It's sold. So yeah, um, there's no ceiling. You can't take these guys in GPP. You just can't do it. The only way you can hope for that to happen is that they score two goals. One person scores both goals and the other person gets both assists or nobody gets assists. And the rest of the slate doesn't manage to produce a two goal score to compete with that raw points that this Huddersfield player would put out. So like that, that's a really rangy script to go for, especially against Cardiff at Cardiff. So not something I'm looking for. Just stick with billing and cash if you're going anywhere. And maybe Losa if you want to be a little bit riskier. Uh, because like I said, he is putting up the numbers. Uh, but that's really all I'll, I'll touch on Huddersfield. And in terms of Cardiff, Cardiff are doing their very best Brighton impression in terms of this is how we're going to stay up. We're going to win games at home. That's just how they're going about this season. They've won the majority of their home games. They're a far better home team than they are away. Uh, but what this slate will be defined by, the biggest point of this entire slate, uh, is whether or not Camarasa plays. If he does not play, Joel Rawls is the absolute must lock 100% either format guy of the slate. Uh, you could either even at that point play both Billing and Rawls or completely drop out Billing 100% um, and just roll with Rawls. Now if Cam Ross is playing, I don't like his salary, but if you're fading the Liverpool Chelsea high end salaries, you can kind of jump on this because there should be lots of relevance for Cardiff in this game. Really, the play this slate is we're hoping Camarasa doesn't play, which isn't the nicest thing I realize that. It's not a malicious hope. Obviously, I'm fully conscious and aware he's not long-term hurt and coming back very, very soon. This is just in the hopes of the DFS relevance for this slate. If he isn't playing and Rawls is in, Rawls is the guy this slate. And I'll probably still rock a fair amount of Rawls just in the case that Camarasa comes off really early, uh, which could very easily happen. Um, in terms of across the board, I like uh, I like Cardiff. Uh, you could rock Etheridge because Huddersfield have such a poor uh, attack. But at the same time, Huddersfield don't put enough shots on net compared to Heaton or some other guys that we'll talk about here very shortly uh, in the same kind of salary range. Uh, so you can, but it's definitely not a, an ideal play for uh, either format. Now, someone like Cunningham, if he gets to the start and right back, I don't dislike it. He's uh, kind of like a, a poor man's low floor, low salary, Hadagajan kind of play. Um I definitely think there's better plays, uh, namely Callum Chambers if he plays uh, as a midfielder. Uh, if you're looking for that style of low, low salary, low floor. Uh, but yeah, it, it, like I said, this is all going to be about Joe Rawls and whether or not he gets the mints. Patterson's a much better player at home than he is away. So another guy that you can consider for GPP is Patterson. If, in fact, Camarasa doesn't play, I have absolutely no issue with the patterson Rawl stack or even going another uh, another route through that, whether it be uh, Bobby Reed, Junior Hoylett, uh, or Josh Murphy. Josh Murphy's salary is getting, and Hoylett's salary is getting into a little bit, uh, a little bit more pricey range than I, I would rather see. But at least uh, I, I would consider Hoylett because he's Canadian. Duh. And uh, he has a little bit more of a steady floor uh, to potentially build a ceiling from. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, really my takes uh, for this. I really like Card of the Slate. I think they're going to score three at home, and I think they're going to be super low owned. And the salaries, when we consider the amount of potential uh, implied totals here that I see coming, uh, compared to the same totals from uh, Liverpool, as we've talked about so far, uh, Cardiff are even up there at, in terms of like how you should value a script of a Liverpool blowout to like taking some Cardiff players. I, I like the Cardiff side. They're going to be lower owned, cheaper, 
allows for a, a, lots of other options. So I'm going to say a 3-1 Cardiff win. Uh, probably more like a 2-1, 2 win. I'll be very surprised if Cardiff failed to score more than once, and I'll be very surprised if Huddersfield score more than once. Next game on the slate, we have Watford traveling to Crystal Palace. And this is going to line up to be another absolute banger of a London Derby slate. Uh, a, a, excuse me, a London Derby game. Um, in the sense that um, Watford are not a DFS side. Um, that's just one way to put it. Now, I'll just break it down position by position. Foster doesn't usually see enough shots to offset the amount of goals he usually lets in. Uh, in the case when this does happen, it's extremely rare and in the most GPP of random stretches because you'll see at the same time he's just as likely to finish with literally nothing uh, than be overly relevant for either format. Holobos is supposed to be one of the top cash plays of the slate. You can't use him in GPP because one, he'll be too high owned, two, he's too expensive, and three, he's just as likely to take a yellow card than any kind of assist or goal upside. Uh, and that immediately chocks off your any kind of true ceiling that you could have had. Uh, in cash, that doesn't necessarily matter because you don't need his best of best best game. You just need him to do better than average. And while that wasn't an issue, his salary hasn't dropped and his gameplay definitely has. And he's still taking his cards and he's still taking his fouls. So uh, uh, it's tough. I'm really not looking at Holabas at all the slate in terms of uh, other defensive options. Uh, now... Pereira is someone that's supposed to be a cash play, but he has absolutely no floor to go with in all the minutes that you could possibly want. Now, you'll see these scores. This is great. This was awesome, actually, but it took three, his three shots in net. If he doesn't get three shots in net, he's not relevant, period, from any salary. And it's fun whenever he's 5K-ish, but when he's above these 6K ranges, it just doesn't compare especially going up against Palace at home, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, Decor shouldn't be a cash play, but he generally puts out a really good floor, uh, and especially from 5.6, that's like the billing. He's like a poor man's billing, but not that much cheaper. Uh, so if you need like a little bit of a pivot, I suppose you could go on to Decor, but uh, I would rather just, again, fade this whole crew. There's not too much there, and their mints are going to start being eaten away once Cleverly starts coming back into full fitness here. And then up front, Troy Deeney is absolutely useless away from home. On top of that, it's incredibly frustrating whenever he gets three points away from home and breaks the slate um yeah <laughs> maybe he's, he's got the away goals in him now I, I don't know what to say it's tough uh he isn't someone that i'm necessarily thrilled about using in any format ever and he's real i shouldn't say he's exclusively a gpp play but he keeps especially in fandle ending up as the guy you should have used in cash because the salary was so cheap uh, so yeah, they're, I like to call them the antithesis of DFS teams. They're basically backwards, ass backwards across the board. So there are targets. Delefeo has all the skill in the world to break a slate if he can manage to stay on for 90 minutes and uh, get enough uh, activity in a game. Uh, as you can see, like, yeah, only two points above the score of a goal. It's tough. It's tough. And... I think one of my main concerns about Watford this slate is that a lot of people are still going to look at Crystal Palace with the tunnel vision and say, oh, they're worth two goals. And while they could be, they're probably not. Crystal Palace actually is third in the league with home clean sheets behind only Liverpool and Chelsea. They keep a lot of their games super low scoring this season, and it's the only way that they're finding relevance without Zaha scoring goals. Um, so this and first and foremost starts with, uh, Goeta doing his best Heaton impression and 
completely turning around the relevance of Crystal Palace. Uh, basically, he's got as many wins with Crystal Palace as Wayne Hansi has got over the previous two seasons. Now, I have to stress this. This is absolutely not just some far-out narrative. This is a Crystal Palace go-to trick. What they do is they play Wayne Hansi for a while, come to the conclusion that he isn't a good goalkeeper, go with their backup goalkeeper, Backup goalkeeper screws up really bad. They're forced to go back to Wayne Hansi. Wayne Hansi plays really good for a few games to reestablish himself and then goes back to crappy Wayne Hansi doing Wayne Hansi things. So this is nothing new. I hope that Guaida is a breath of fresh air into this uh, reoccurring trend and that he's actually going to win Palace some games. But in terms of an overall, uh, across the board, Palace are pretty good at home. Uh, their floors are decent. There isn't a lot of ceiling. That's the issue. So you're going to have to keep these guys to cash, except for the defense, which you can chase ceilings with. Uh, whether it's Guaida, uh, Juan Bissaka, in either site has relevance, especially against a team like Watford, uh, who are going to be giving up possession a lot. Uh, Van Anhold, if you're looking for someone with lots of shots, 4.9K isn't exactly ideal from him, for him, uh, but uh, Wan Bissaka has a much better floor. Maybe uh, Van Anhold and GPP, or take all three with the goalkeeper. Um, it's it's tough. Again, you should be able to take. It's hard to say who's going to start at center back for Crystal Palace, but especially on FanDuel, it's extremely relevant this slate with the perceived or implied total crosses that should be coming from guys like Pereira and uh, Delafeu and Holobas and Jan Matt. Um, they should have tons of clearances this slate. Um, as a home team, that's not always necessarily the the best place to go looking, uh, but yeah. It should work, especially on FanDuel. Um, Milicevic still manages to find relevance despite being like the most unsustainable player in English Premier League history. And uh, Townsend is always someone who is cash relevant. Now, here's the thing. Townsend really shouldn't be cash relevant this late because what most people will be doing is focusing on the Liverpool and Chelsea salaries. And in doing so, completely gut themselves from any ability of taking guys like Townsend, James Madison, or Milicevic and GPP. Now, in terms of Townsend, if you're under the notion that we're tempering expectations for Liverpool and Chelsea, Townsend lines up as one of the top cash plays this slate. At uh, 8.4K, it still doesn't really match up to his play, but compared to the rest of the slate, if Liverpool and Chelsea aren't doing it, he's next on the doorstep to be doing it in terms of floor. Uh, so yeah, I have absolutely no issue with Townsend and cash the slate, especially if you're looking to pivot off the Chelsea or Liverpool ownership. Uh, I'll talk about Chelsea a little bit later, uh, but yeah, it... it it's, it's tough. You're going to have to take a stand. Uh, but Towns is definitely next in line for that stand. Uh, and I'm going to keep fading Zaha until he starts showing any kind of life and ability. In ter- and in general, all of the Palace forwards. If Connor Wickham somehow gets a start, maybe at 4.1k. He is a six foot four behemoth giant. And that has relevance in any team, basically any league. Uh, so I, I don't hate that, but I would be very surprised if he actually gets to start up front. Um, I want to say Palace are going to break out of their shell and do something crazy like a 4-1 four, four win or something. But I don't, obviously, that's just being unrealistic. Very likely a one nothing Watford win, a 0-0 draw, a 1-1 draw. Maybe a team will score two. But this game really shouldn't finish under, or this game shouldn't finish, excuse me, over three goals total. Very unlikely, unlikely I will see that. Next game on the slate, the last normal time game, we have Southampton traveling to Leicester. So very quickly on this, um, Southampton are just simply a bad team. They're not very good. The issue now is they have, easily the next up-and-coming English goaltender. I've been talking about Angus Gunn for a long time. If you're following me on Twitter, I mentioned him previous to last slate that everyone is going to have to take a shot on him, even against Chelsea, because it's Angus Gunn. He has the sickest name in the league, bar none, but 
legitimately, this guy has a pedigree a mile long. I won't get too deeply into it if you're not a soccer fan, but again, uh, I talked about it in my article this uh, this weekend. If you're a football fan, imagine if Drew Brees' son was trained by Peyton Manning and Eli Manning from basically day one until his draft year. Uh, and that's basically what you get with Angus Gunn. His father was one of the best English keepers in English history, and he's been trained by what is considered and undisputed the top two English goalkeepers were his father's best for goalkeeper coaches excuse me were his father's best friends and basically had him under his wing his entire life he's still incredibly young Southampton just bought him for Man City don't be surprised if Angus Gunn is on the English national team one year from now uh legitimate future star for England so with that in mind if he keeps getting the go here we may keep having to roll with him at 4.2K. I'm sure at some point he's going to see some regression and it's going to hurt and it's going to suck. But for the time being, you can probably keep rolling with him because absolutely nobody's going to be own, owning Angus Gunn outside of the fool, the fools who like his name kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, don't be afraid to jump on Angus Gunn. If you got an inkling to kind of do it, do it. Jump on Angus Gunn. He's worth every uh, every risk amount of risk that you can put on him uh, this slate. Um, now, in terms of the rest of Southampton, there's not a whole lot to look at. Their salaries are all creeping into a range where we need ceilings, and Southampton isn't a team to get a ceiling. Now, one of my main meta plays over the past couple of seasons where Southampton have had the same coach is that any South any counterattacking team absolutely obliterates Southampton and. That has been remaining true with Leicester over the past couple of seasons, absolutely obliterating Southampton. Southampton haven't scored in four straight games against Leicester. Uh, one of I've seen, I've seen they've, I think it's uh, 29 uh, games they've uh, played or something like that at home, and uh, only one has gone Southampton's way. Like, uh, don't bet on a Southampton win. That would be my first objective. But considering Angus Gunn is so cheap. Uh, we don't necessarily need a win, just five saves, and as long as he keeps Leicester under two goals, we'll be fine. Uh, so that's the big thing. If you think Leicester will blow them out, now, Chelsea are a, set, are a counterattacking team, and we saw what happened. Angus Gunn stood on his head and was uh, managed to steal the slate. Now, can that repeat against Leicester? Absolutely. Chelsea are one of the best teams in Europe. There's no reason that can't happen to literally any team in the league. Uh, I'm just... Not as keen to say it's going to happen instantly again. Now, I would also be less as le less keen to say that my meta play is fully in play because Southampton are under a new coach and Leicester are under a new coach, and in both circumstances, neither really fit into the former narrative. Especially the Southampton uh, plays a different, completely different style, uh, while Leicester is still fairly counterattacking. Now, the main thing for Leicester is that they're probably going to concede uh, even uh, against Southampton. They've done so all season against lesser opponents and 5.2K. We consider guys like Angus Gunn on the other side of the field who should see at least double the amount of saves or Tom Heaton who should have just as good a floor if not more upside for a cheaper salary. Uh, I just don't see as much reason to play someone like Schmeichel. Now, the same issue could be said about the defense. They're all reaching salaries that we need a ceiling from. And if they concede, they're toast. And their floors aren't going to cut it, especially compared to someone like Wynn Bensaka from the exact same salary range should outscore uh, either Fox or Chilwell, whoever ends up starting, or Pereira if he ends up starting in the midfield and only getting 60, 70 minutes. I don't mind Christian Fox. It's not, it's not that he's a bad player. It's just that um, he... His minutes are incredibly unreliable, and you never know where he's going to pop in. And then he's just as likely to come off for Chilwell uh, than play a full. Uh, so it's tough. Now, I really like James Masson. I think he's going to be super low on this slate. And I also very passionately believe that Southampton are going to open themselves up to the exact play of Masson. Now, I think Jamie Vardy at the exact same time is an excellent GP play. And th these two stack so brilliantly this slate, especially if you're fading the notion that Liverpool and Chelsea are going to blow out. So, yeah, one of my favorite stacks this slate is probably Jamie Vardy and, and James Madison. Uh, 
a little bit heavy in terms of salary. You're definitely cutting your legs out everywhere else, but in doing so, you're also taking a stand against a massive ownership edge, which will be on the other high-end salaries, uh, especially the Liverpool stack. So uh, as soon as you take a Liverpool stack, you're basically gutting yourself from owning uh, Townsend, any of the Leicester uh you can really afford anyone else, but so far anyway. So yeah, um, I don't mind those two. I, I think that's really sharp. And especially if Southampton draw a penalty shot, which I think is very relevant to Chase also, um, Jamie Vardy will be taking them and he should be back to 90 minute games. Now, a really interesting stat is so far this season, Southampton, actually not just this season, in basically or since they've gotten to the English Premier League, they've given up the most leads basically they've taken leads and not ended up winning the game where Leicester on the flip side has the most comeback to find results now I shouldn't say victories they don't always win but they come back from losing situations to find results uh more than uh, I think actually they're tied with Arsenal right now with nine uh uh nine games or nine points three wins this season so yeah um if Southampton get out to an early lead, start rubbing your hands because you know Leicester are going to come back with at least two. And then guys like Jamie Vardy and James Masson will compete with the Liverpools and Chelsea's as long as the Liverpools and Chelsea's comparatively from their salary stay under three goals and don't have like super condensed production from one guy. Because I'm pretty sure if Leicester having any kind of condensed production, it's coming all from Jamie Vardy and James Madison combined a la Ryan Fraser, Callum Wilson last late. Uh, so yeah, I will say a 2-1 Leicester victory, 2 nothing maybe, um, maybe even a, a one nothing Southampton 0-0 draw if Angus Gunn decides to play in his head. Uh, stand this head. I still don't mind Angus Gunn for uh, a really uh, low salary uh, floor kind of play this slate because Leicester should still get lots of shots on that and they're not a team to blow people out anymore. Last game of the slate, we have Newcastle traveling to Chelsea. And really quickly here, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, Chelsea has basically fallen off the earth in terms of scoring goals. And Newcastle has basically entirely all season kept scores really low and really close. So the idea here is that how many will Newcastle score either 0 or 1? That's really the first part. And then how many will Chelsea score two or more than two or less than two? If it's less than two, you can fade Chelsea and they can still win. And you can really fade this entire late slate. Or um, if you think they're going to score more than two on Newcastle, which is actually kind of unlikely, um, then maybe uh, you may want to start taking some guys like Hazard. The big issue here is, well, there's two main issues. The first rumbling on the street is that Hazard is the new center forward and he's going to be playing as the center forward. Now, if that happens, Pedro and Willian will play on the sides. The issue there is that Giroud and Morata are both capable on at, for coming on. Basically, in Chelsea and Hull, the whole issue is that someone's able to come onto the field and take their position, whether it's Willian playing on the wing and more, Pedro coming in for him and Hazard on the other side with either Giroud and Morata. Uh, Murad up front with those two interchangeable or Hazard, Hazard, Hazard plays up front with Pedro and William on the side and then both Drew and Murata can come in and uh, take either the wingers off and Hazard can go out in either wing. Uh, so William belongs on the left wing, Hazard belongs on the left wing, left wing. So both of them can't play in that same spot. It really wouldn't surprise me this late to see Hazard play the center forward, William out left and Pedro at right, the big concern being that uh, someone comes on for someone and you're screwed with tons of salary in a late game in the hole with like absolutely no hope in coming back. Uh, so I'm more comfortable fading the late game. Uh, I think that there's a lot bigger edge, assuming Chelsea won't score three goals. Uh, I think there's a lot more value in uh, shooting for that in other 8K salaries uh, with much better floors. Uh, like, William is more guaranteed to come off the field than produce a substantial floor to 
be relevant from 9.5K. Can he? Absolutely. It's William, it's Chelsea, it's against Newcastle. But is that kind of relevance there compared to even someone like Townsend, who's on a team that's lucky to score a goal, but he's still going to score 15 fantasy points because he's playing 90 minutes guaranteed. You know what I mean? So it's really tough to jump on someone like William. And Hazard just doesn't have that floor period, and he's not scoring goals anymore. Can you really pay 11.2K when at the same time you know Salah could at least get a penalty shot? Now, that's not to say uh, Hazard can't get a penalty shot too. But Newcastle just offer a lot less ceiling to Chelsea than Brighton offered to Liverpool. So I like a Chelsea fade before Liverpool. That's why I'm so keen about fading the late hammer game this slate. Um... There are choices on Newcastle. They're dealing with some losses uh, in terms of uh, bodies. So I think Matt Ritchie is ultra viable in either format this slate. I want to say just GPP, but it's potentially either format. Because especially in DraftKings, he just throws balls into boxes. The, the big issue is that he's probably coming off the field. The real kicker here though is that Chelsea's just absolutely brutal against crosses and set pieces and Matt Ritchie just crosses and takes set pieces especially if John Joe Shelby is out there's a super limited pool of set piece options for Newcastle and Ritchie just may end up playing 90 minutes because of that uh, so yeah at the same time if you can try and find the other end of the Ritchie crosses uh, maybe Lacassels or Karen Clark or Fernandez is absolutely dominant in the air. If he happens to get the start, I have no issue with him chasing a GPP goal. But Rondon is really the guy. Uh, 5.1K. I'm concerned about his minutes, but it's Rondon. 5.1K. He's six foot four, 230 pounds. Chelsea haven't been able to deal with, like, Chikorito at 5'8", 170 pounds in the air. So, like, yeah, uh, I, I just don't see Rondon struggling to not find relevance in GPP. Furthermore, uh, get this out. Uh, I think uh, one of my favorite stacks this slate is a Leicester-Newcastle stack between Jamie Vardy, Madison. Uh, Joel, if Keeping Joel Rawls in there if you want, but uh, for the sake, we'll take him out. And rolling with something like this. Uh, you're still leaving yourself with tons of salary. You can get basically any defender you want. Chase clean sheets uh, for goaltender if you'd like. Uh, the big key here is that we only really need one goal for Newcastle from Richie and Rondon from those salaries. One goal. You're going to need a little bit more from Vardy and Madison. But that's really possible. And it's going to be low owned and not so much of a salary risk that if they don't do mind-blowingly awesome, it's not the end of the world. We need Salah and Hazard and William and Shakiri and all these guys over 9K to do mind-blowingly awesome. Because guys in Cardiff and Crystal Palace's floors and uh, Crystal Palace's defense and Burnley's uh, goalkeeper and even their uh, potential crossing output floor, they'll be really condensed in Johan berg Goodmanson if he plays. Like These guys are all going to be competing against the Liverpool and Chelsea salaries and probably doing better than. So... Don't be afraid to chase a little Newcastle. Their starters aren't set in stone, so you're going to need to give yourself a little bit of wiggle room. But I would chase Newcastle six times over uh, six times out of ten over Chelsea. No question this slate. Uh, because so many people are going to be on Chelsea. Now, in terms of Debraca, you can get away with this. Uh, I absolutely support it at 3.7K. He's done this all season against all sorts of different competitions, so there's no reason to assume he can't do it against uh, Chelsea. Now, um, is it my absolute favorite play of the slate? No, I'd much rather spend around the just below 5K range. But out of the low salary keepers, uh, Debrac is easily the, sal the, the low salary keeper to go with. So I'm going to say final score here, 2-1 Chelsea victory. Uh, maybe uh, a 1-1 draw if uh, Newcastle get really fortunate. But I'll be very surprised if Chelsea fail to win another game at home here against a team that really doesn't deserve to tie their shoes. Uh, that shouldn't happen again. Uh, but like last slate, my last words were uh, maybe, you should, uh, maybe you should fade them. And once again, maybe you should fade them. 
So that is the English Premier League slate for January 12th, 2019. RotoPros.com. Get over. Check us out. Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter. Sir Robert Sexton on the main sites. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope everyone has an excellent weekend. Uh, starting to enjoy some NFL playoffs and uh, really, you know, get out and enjoy the winter. Uh, if you're getting some snow, love that snow. It's cold up here in Canada, so I wish everyone the best. Take care. Much love. See you at the top.